Hello, Xers and interwebbers. Welcome to Naive in the 90s, the podcast. I'm your host, Emily. I was a 70s baby, an 80s kid, and a 90s troublemaker. Today, we're going to babble a little and talk about one of my favorite all-time 90s movies, Bram Stoker's Dracula. So I had a special guest lined up for today's show. We had a really fun topic, but unfortunately, just a couple days before our call, Anchor, which is the podcast host and service I use, did a full rebranding to Spotify for podcasters. Now, this change started back in 2019 when Spotify actually bought Anchor, but it wasn't until last week that they did the full scale rebranding. I'm actually pretty excited about it in general because there is promise of no cuts of what we already use on Anchor and that they are going to actually add new features and tools. But like any big switch, this is not without its snags. And unfortunately, the one that seems the biggest is the remote calling or the invite a friend option. It just isn't working at all, which is a super bummer because it's really been fantastic. Could I use another means of recording? Sure, of course. Um, But to be honest, Anchor was far superior to any of the other options I looked into, especially at the price point, which is free. And for a very new and small podcaster like myself who just kind of started their show on a whim, it was a huge deal to be at that price point. Um, Plus, the recording quality is actually pretty decent. The app turns your phone's internal mic into a podcasting mic, just kind of meaning that it clears up the main audio and it muffles out some of the background noise. So basically, you can just talk on your phone like a phone and record the episode with your guests like you're just chit-chatting with friends and you can have up to five guests on with you plus and this is my favorite part you can record for up to two hours so yeah um it isn't working and the episode i had planned prepped for outlined had articles saved for and just a super fun guest ready to go And I do mean ready to go because we found this out as we were like on messenger getting ready for the call. Um, But um, yeah, it just it didn't work. And I did contact Spotify in multiple ways and was told that they are aware of the issue and that they are working on it, but they don't have any estimate of when or like how soon it's going to be back, but I was told directly that it should be soon and that everyone will be up and running again. So fingers crossed it happens because ugh, it's very frustrating. So today's episode, um, because of that whole mic and recording with friends issue, um, is going to be random. <laughs> and um, I'm sure the pro and OG podcasters out there are just dying to yell at me because most sources about podcasting tell you to have and I've seen different numbers here but a lot of people say um, and the range I've seen is about three to 15 episodes have them done and ready just for these types of situations the ones that are out of our control you know emergencies sickness tech issues cancellations anything that can pop up and throw off your schedule. That way you don't get thrown for a loop and you don't have to stress and scramble, which of course makes perfect sense. Um, But that just isn't how I roll. And oddly, for really just this, like just for podcasting, and um, well, I don't know, maybe it's other creative endeavors that I do because I do a lot of creative things just I don't know I'm confusing (laughs) even to myself but like normally I like to be like planned and prepared for things but I don't know 
Um, I started this podcast on a whim and I basically do my episodes the same way. I'm just here really to like have an outlet to talk about my book and my life experiences, not to be some big pro podcaster with some large thing going on. I'm just here to share, connect, talk through some things, have some fun maybe, and get a little nostalgic about a really intense and complex time. Even um, my book, I didn't write it and publish it to have something huge. It really was just, you know, my husband and I, and really just, I, I saw something that had some possible value for someone out there who may feel alone or confused or rejected or hopeless or just, you know, so much more because um, we are human and we are very complicated. And But I just thought maybe my experience in this world, even if, you know, it's in a setting that might be in the past could bring a little insight to some and maybe some connection and hope for others. Whether a parent with a teen they see going through things and they're not sure what or how to handle it, or if it's a young person who's feeling isolated, alone, misunderstood, or just on a bumpy path. I am just, you know, I put this stuff out there because I trust the universe to put it in front of, and by it, I mean my book or this podcast, I trust the universe to put it in front of whoever needs it. And if that also happens to be some that just feel nostalgic or curious about a time or even just someone's diary, then, um, you know, that's super cool too. Really, I'm just here to create whatever I'm feeling and to share and just live the best way I can. And uh, yeah, so here we are, a squirrel-brained, narrow, spicy 45-year-old who has a random book and an even more random podcast. And uh, <laughs> yeah, um, which I, I swear, despite my very unpro approach, is something I do strive to keep improving on and learning about and hopefully bringing somewhat interesting but 100% real and raw content to. Um, so, you know, when things happen and things don't go to, as planned, we get these random episodes. <laughs> And um, yeah, so with that said, or babbled, uh, let's just jump into it. But of course, first, a quick passage from my book, um, Naive in the 90s, which is a creative nonfiction based on real life diaries and journals from the early and mid 90s. Um, it's available now on Amazon and the link will be in the description below. August 25th, 1993, Wednesday. Well, we're home from Cali, and I didn't write in here at all. Hold on, Runaway Train by Soul Asylum is on, and I love it. Got a ticket for a runaway train, like a madman laughing at the rain. A little out of touch, little insane. It's just easier than dealing with the pain. That's such a great song. I feel it so deep in my veins. I want to run away all the time from everything. Anyways, Kelly was okay. I mean, it was a family vacation, so it did get boring sometimes. I met some cool people, watched Dracula like a million times on pay-per-view, ate some good food, and hung out with my cousins and all my California family. It was pretty cool, but I did miss James and my friends so much. James had gone camping at the beach two weeks before I left. Then I was gone for a month, so it was like, ah! But when he did get back from his vacation, he wrote me a letter and it was so sweet. He said stuff like, I miss you. Been too long since I've seen ya. Can't wait for you to get back. I love you. I was so happy that I started to laugh and cry at the same time. I love him so much.
Okay, um, so first off, I just want to point out that those lyrics for Runaway Train were wrong. <laughs> um, the real ones start with, bought a ticket, and I wrote, got a ticket. Um, just one little piece of evidence of how much harder it was for music fans, more specifically fans of lyrics that had not great listening and dictation skills, apparently. Um, like seriously, people who grew up with Google and things like Spotify that just have the lyrics right there, they don't know how good they have it. Like, we had to get the album, whether that be a record, a tape, or even CDs, and you had to hope that the artist or band put an insert in behind the art, like the cover art, and that that, that insert even had lyrics on it, because sometimes it was just, like, thanking people and more art. Um, sometimes records would have lyrics on the record inner paper sleeve thingy, and then tapes would be cool and sometimes have the cover art piece inside. It would like accordion unfold out and CDs. The cover art would be like a little booklet. And that was just how we got correct lyrics. And if the album, which you had to buy again, you know, you had to buy it. You didn't just, you couldn't just look it up for free. Um, you had to buy it to get those lyrics. But if you didn't like if they didn't have the lyrics you were pretty much at the mercy of how your hearing or comprehension were like if you had bad hearing bad comprehension <laughs> oh well <laughs> um which definitely led to a lot of misheard and definitely like misquoted lyrics hence my got when it was clearly bought but i was just listening to the radio at the time and you know just being an angsty teen, so yeah, not great at taking notes, even when it was the song I was singing, <laughs> so yeah. Anyways, like the passage said, I went to California with my immediate family to visit my dad's side of the family, which was the Vietnamese side. We went often through the years and actually lived out there for a little while when I was a preschooler. And when we went back to visit um, cross country to California or even down south or up to Canada to visit family, we went for weeks, no less than two weeks, but usually three or four. Sometimes we flew and sometimes we drove and like just did road trips, which are definitely core memories from the cars to the food and like the snacks and the stops and the music and even how the sky looked whizzing by like it just so much so much of the memory um but that particular trip i was 15 and i was too cool for everything like everything and everyone I wore my Megadeth and Pearl Jam black concert tees with flannels and black boots way more than I probably should have for summer in California and made sure to not ever take off my silver and turquoise sleeve bracelet even for the wedding that we were there to attend. And part of my angsty teen visit that year was I literally watched Bram Stoker's Dracula no less than twice a day that we were there. And probably so much more than that because I'd watch it not just during the day but also like super late when everyone was sleeping and while my family went out and did fun stuff. I would stay at the house and sulk about being away from my friends at home and just keep the pay-per-view loop of Dracula going. It's funny now, but wow, teens, huh? <laughs> like, ooh. um, like for real, my parents and brothers and my aunts and uncles and cousins and just whomever, um, they like, they went to some zoo or animal place and ended up meeting Jack Hanna, who was filming his show there. And all the while, I was sitting at the house and just watched the same movie again and again. And like, you know, now don't get me wrong. I was at the time, I was 100% A-OK -okay with this arrangement. As a teen, I wanted nothing to do with my family, especially outings that I thought were more like kid-based because I had younger brothers and my cousins were all younger and just, it was just, you know, I was too cool for that. 
But what the hell? Like, now I'm like, I love animals, so boo for past me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 1992's Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula was and still is one of my very favorite movies of all times. I've seen it countless times back then, and even now I still revisit it very often. It is 100% a comfort movie for me. Although it is classified as horror, and in general, I don't normally handle horror very well. This movie, ugh, there is literally nothing I do not absolutely love and adore about it. The colors, the music, the costumes, the cast, the dialogue, everything is just, oh, chef's kiss perfection. Like Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder, Gary freaking Oldman, and what, like, Lucy and all of her suitors and oh my gosh even Dracula's brides it was a lot of beautiful and confusing yumminess for a teen starting to notice everyone and everything between this movie cast and 90s Drew Barrymore <laughs> really realizing I may swing a little more left from center than you know, some other people was definitely a thing at the time. Um, but this movie was just, oh, so much beautiful people in beautiful turn of the century period clothing against the backdrop of dark and gothic, just everything. Just yes, a please and a thank you very much. Um, but not only was this movie visually appealing to me in every single way, but beyond the imagery, the words, there are just so many lines of dialogue that live rent-free in my mind and probably my soul at this point. I won't start rattling off all of the quotes I love and just, you know, I if I did, I would end up reciting most of the, the movie at that point. Um, but here are a few that are just, oh, they're just, they're awesome. So Dracula, and he says, do you believe in destiny that even the powers of time can be altered for a simple purpose? That the luckiest man who walks on this earth is the one who finds true love. I mean, like, come on, <laughs> like, ooh, <laughs> And then, of course, the Dracula line, I have crossed oceans of time to find you. I mean, um, come on, swoon. Yes, please take my blood, sir. You can, you, you just, you can have it all. <laughs> and my favorite, it's always been and probably always will be, is when Mina says, I want to be what you are, see what you see, love what you love. And then Dracula replies with, Mina, to walk with me, you must die your breathing life and be reborn to mine. And then he starts doing the whole vampire thing. And then he has second thoughts and he's like, I cannot. And he's like, stop, I can't do this. I can't let you be this. And Mina's like, I don't care. Make me yours. And Dracula says, you will be cursed as I am to walk in the shadows of death for all of eternity. I love you too much to condemn you. And then she says, and I loved this whole dialogue and interaction forever. Like seriously, decades at this point. But then she says to this, then take me away from all this death. And I have to say, I think it says a lot for their acting because, wow, <laughs> I still love it. But also, what the hell, Mina? That argument makes no sense. He just said you will be cursed to walk in the shadows of death for all of eternity. That's not taking you away from all of this death. It's making you a part of it, homegirl. Like, I get it the count he's sexy af but dude <laughs> he is he is sexy but so then say hey cool because i like hanging in the shadows and death so it works out don't say take me away from this death like it's some checkmate freaking argument for his hesitation 
But also, joke's on me, right? Because it works. He's all, boo, living with all this death, not for you. And she's like, but look, I'm licking your bloody chest. Like, pretend this makes sense, okay? And Dracula, he's like, you know what? Mm, good enough. Lick up on me, dear. Just slurp away, okay? <laughs> like, I love it, but it's just a little funny to me. Like, Dracula's logic and sense just got clouded by his and Mina's vampire blood horniness, and it's just, it's funny. <laughs> When I realized my plan episode was getting delayed and I had to figure out another topic, I remembered a Mental Floss article I saw recently with a few fun facts, like type things, about Bram Stoker's Dracula, and the link will be in the description, um, but it was pretty cool, and I knew I had mentioned the movie briefly in my book, and that's how we ended up here. Um, this movie was just so huge to me and to a bunch of my friends back then, too. In fact, if you listened to the She Talks to Angels episode um, with Anne and Amy, we mentioned a Dracula poster that Anne had in her room. It was awesome. I think she had gotten it from one of our local video rental stores because it was like an actual movie poster poster. Um, I think that's where she got it. I'm not sure, but it was so cool. And she just, she was like the queen of posters. She had so many awesome ones. But, um, yeah, so let's look at this article real quick. One of the things I thought was super interesting was that the movie took a really long time to come from the idea to the movie we got in 1992. In the late 1970s, screenwriter James V. Hart began the screenplay, and it took him over a decade to finish it. I mean, definitely worth it, and I love that it came out when it came out because it was the perfect time for Teen Me to fall in love with it. Um, but wow, right? Like, over a decade. Again, totally worth it. And a kind of crazy to think about, like, almost happened thing with Bram Stoker's was that it was almost a basic cable movie, you know, like a USA movie type thing. Um, yeah, like what? <laughs> um, yikes. But yeah, none of the big studios wanted it until Winona Ryder read the script and fell in love with it. And then when she got on board with it, the rest of it took shape and people took it seriously. Also, another reason to thank Winona Ryder for this magnificent movie is she's the reason that Coppola agreed to direct the movie. He did it as a way to show her that even though a past project didn't work out for them, he in no way held hard feelings. Um, which, you know, that's kind of cool. Like, she was supposed to play a part, and then there was a conflict of scheduling, so instead of, you know, waiting for her, because it wasn't a huge part, um, he used his own daughter in the part, and she, and she, I mean, meaning Winona Ryder, actually thought that, um, Francis Ford Coppola didn't like her. And so this was his way of showing her that, in fact, he really did like her. He took the project on solely because she was there. Okay, so now this is super, 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 super weird to picture, but I feel like that's the case most of the time when hearing who could have played parts that we know and love. But both Johnny Depp and Christian Slater could have ended up as our Jonathan Hawker instead of Keanu Reeves, which for both almost Jonathans, just, I just, I then oh, yeah, I, no, I don't, my brain, no, I don't like it. <laughs> um, thank goodness neither happened, although Johnny Depp may have been okay, but I just, I don't know, I feel like it would have been more Sleepy Hollow-ish if he had been there. And I think Christian Slater would have just been a straight-up disaster. I just can't even picture him in any way being Jonathan Hawker. Like, ugh, yuck. Because, ugh. <laughs> but um, this is, a, again, with this film, we can thank Winona Ryder for saving the day and for this movie being what it is because she was the one who suggested Keanu. And, I mean, score! Another cool thing about this movie is 
even if some of the special effects seem a bit dated, um, they are still actually very, very cool. Um, it's really kind of neat because pretty much all of the visual effects are done in camera or otherwise called practical effects, which is stuff like miniatures, forced perspective, reverse, you know, reversed film, double exposure, stuff like that, as opposed to things being added after filming and post-production. And that is super hard and it is super cool. And the last random fact about the movie we're going to talk about is the fact that the ending we got was actually not the original ending. In fact, the original ending was fully filmed and even previewed in a private screening. Coppola had invited his friend and fellow writer, director, and Hollywood great, George Lucas, who after the screening pointed out a continuity error with how Dracula was finally killed. Because of Lucas's catch of the mistake, they were able to reshoot the ending so that it worked. Apparently, originally, Mina only stabs Dracula in the heart to kill him. But earlier in the movie, it's mentioned that in order to truly kill a vampire, you need to cut off its head. Just like, you know, kind of what they did and why they do what they did to Lucy earlier in the film. So yeah, good catch, Mr. Lucas. So I think that's going to do it for this episode. It may have ended up a little random with podcast snafus and old movie talk, but hey, that's just how it be sometimes when you have a chaotic squirrel brain and just, you know, <laughs> it's just how it is. So yeah. Thank you for joining me for Naive in the 90s, the podcast. I hope you come back in two weeks for a new episode. Make sure to follow so you don't miss it. And please consider leaving a rating or review if you enjoy the show. For any comments, questions, feedback, or contributions to the conversation, send me a message at naiveinthe90s at gmail.com or connect with me on social media with the handle at naiveinthe90s. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and now YouTube. Of course, don't forget to grab your copy of the creative nonfiction book, Naive in the 90s, now available on Amazon. And if you enjoyed the book, please make sure to leave a review. Each and every one truly helps. Thank you for joining. Hope to see you next time. Peace and love, my dudes.